the yield curve inverts. We are either in a recession or not far from a recession. And we would say uh, we've been in a rolling recession for the past year, year and a half. The yield curve inverted for the first time in July of 2022. So it has been more than a year. And uh, we think that it is a harbinger of much uh, slower economic growth and uh, lower inflation than most people believe. Markets celebrated a boost on Wednesday with the U.S. Treasury's announcement of plans to marginally increase government bond sales in Q4 2023, falling short of investors' expectations. This move triggered a 20 basis points decline in U.S. 10-year yields, marking the most substantial daily drop since the onset of the recent bond tantrum in the summer. The dovish signals from the Federal Open Market Committee and a lackluster ISM manufacturing report further contributed to this downward movement. This development is particularly welcomed, given the diminishing share of longer-dated marketable issuance compared to visa vis bills over the last three quarters. The benchmark 10-year U.S. Treasury note, which touched 5% for the first time in 16 years last week, has ignited debates on whether it has reached its peak or is taking another step in its prolonged and disruptive ascent. With interest rates at multi-year highs, there's a potential risk of depressing economic activity and putting a strain on household consumption, especially as excess savings are dwindling. Governments face the challenge of rapidly restoring sovereign credibility by curtailing spending to compress risk premiums. This comes at a crucial juncture when public welfare programs must expand. Kathy Wood provides a more detailed outlook on fiscal policy's implications for the economy, sharing perspectives on monetary policy and various economic indicators. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. The government may shut down in mid-November. We do have a new speaker in the House, but uh, there is still a partisan saber rattling. Or they may get, they may get a continuing re resolution so we don't have to deal with this over the holidays uh, and move uh, the debate into January. Uh, it's just becoming... Uh, it's just becoming de rigueur now, and uh, I think investors are getting used to it. They don't like it. Nobody likes it, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, the other thing that happened actually this week was an executive order on artificial intelligence, which uh, we think can be described as serious overreach and uh, certainly favors the incumbents and uh, and we think would really hurt innovation. Uh, so it is an executive order. We do think uh, that both Bitcoin or crypto or digital assets and artificial intelligence now could become part of the election year debate. The federal deficit as a percent of nominal GDP uh, since the late 60s uh, and I remember in moving into the business or coming into the business in the early, late 70s, early 80s, um, during the Reagan administration, uh, when the deficit hit 5%, there was hell to pay. I mean, uh, the, uh, both sides of the aisle were up in arms. Now, it happened because of back-to-back -back recessions, you can see in the shaded lines there. And as uh, Chairman, Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Paul Volcker was slamming the brakes on money growth. Uh, and so we had, uh, we had a, a, a difficult period. Uh, and typically the deficit does go up during difficult periods, uh, recessions in particular, uh, because of what we call contracyclical spending. This is what government is supposed to do, provide a safety net. Well, you can see uh, what's happened since then. Um, we're now without, a, supposedly without a recession, we're at roughly 6% uh, as a percent of GDP, the deficit is. And uh, so the question is, oh my goodness, what would happen in a recession? Well, you saw what happened in, in COVID. During COVID, uh, that's where contracyclical spending really kicked in. And, um, and so we're back roughly to where the deficit was pre-COVID. Uh, now, as many of you may know, uh, we believe we've been in a rolling recession for the last uh, few years, and we'll get into that with more charts. 
So maybe this uh, spending and this deficit is more contracyclical than many, many people think. Um, and we learned from the early 80s that the best way to get out of a deficit like this is to have very rapid growth. Uh, so you'll look at the 80s and 90s. Uh, we had spectacular growth. Technology was coming of age. Uh, inflation and interest rates were coming down. And you can see what happened to the deficit. It turned into a surplus uh, during uh, Bill Clinton's administration. And we think that could happen again. So we are not as negative about the deficit, although we do believe uh, that the spending programs that have been put in place in the last couple of years after the initial COVID spending have been overdone. And uh, as I've mentioned in, in prior, uh, prior in the nose, uh, government spending is taxation of one form or another. It will turn into taxation, whether actual taxes to try and cure it, um, or in the case of a rapid, uh, rapidly growing economy, the taxes that go with that, that would be a good solution, or inflation. And many people look at what's going on now and say, this is a recipe for inflation. The way to get out of debt is to inflate uh, inflated away. Uh, we don't think that's going to be the case. And we'll get into a few indicators in a moment that support our view that actually the risk is not inflation uh, moving forward. It is deflation. While monetary policy takes the lead in the battle against inflation, fiscal policy plays a crucial role in restoring price stability and mitigating the impact of the cost of living crisis, especially for vulnerable populations. When contemplating new measures or reforms amid significant inflation, policymakers must recognize that different households may already be experiencing substantial distributive effects. Implementing intelligent fiscal policies involves making difficult choices on budget items, deciding what to cut, protect, or expand. This strategic approach can complement monetary policy efforts to reduce inflation while safeguarding those most affected by the cost of living crisis. Now let's return to the video where Kathy Wood shares her perspective on monetary policies. Chairman Powell this week during his, uh, his comments after, uh, after the board meeting, um, I think he had an inkling that the employment reports this week were going to be weak. Um, maybe, I think he probably had a sense of initial claims. They went up. Um, but also perhaps an early read on the employment report, which today was very weak. Um, and one of the reasons it is so weak is um, this chart. So this is money growth, uh, M2 growth on a year-over-year -year basis, going back into the 60s, early 60s. Uh, and you can see we've never seen a decline in money like this in this period of time. You have to go back to the 1930s, uh, which of course was the Great Depression, to see a, a decline in money like this. Now, this is the other side of what happened during COVID. So it's to be under, uh, it's understandable to some extent. Um, but now we're, we're soon going to be lapping uh, one full year of negative money. And, um, and so the course correction has taken place, we believe. If money doesn't pick up, then what we will conclude is um, it's, it's becoming a serious drag on the economy. And uh, deposits are leaving the system. The, the regional banks still are losing deposits. That's, a, uh, that's part of uh, the decline in money. Uh, and that's, that's not a good thing. In fact, uh, the, the KRE regional bank index um, is revisiting its March lows when we were in, uh, in a crisis around the regional banks. So the regional bank uh, index is, is a warning that Fed policy has uh, just overdone it here. Um, we hope it doesn't break down uh, the, the index. Uh, uh, and there is, um, it, it is possible that some of the numbers coming out now are making the case for a Fed pivot so clear uh, that the regional banks uh, will not face as stiff a competition from money market funds and will be able to, to, to uh, attract uh, deposits again. So uh, this is M2, um, still declining year over year. Uh, and here is the yield curve. Now we've talked about uh, the yield curve 
here many times. Here's the picture going back into the 70s. Um, this is the 10-year treasury yield minus the two-year treasury yield. And when it's below zero, it means that short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates, which is not normal, as you can see from this chart. And you can also see that typically when the yield curve inverts, we are either in a recession or not far from a recession. And we would say uh, we've been in a rolling recession for the past year, year and a half. The yield curve inverted for the first time in July of 2022. So it has been more than a year. And uh, we think that it is a harbinger of much uh, slower economic growth and uh, lower inflation than most people believe. Um, the other point we like to make about this chart is, you know, to see a yield curve uh, going down to minus one or one, minus one percent or 100 basis points, just like it did in the early 80s today is quite something because the base of rates is so much lower. So today we have the long bond yield in the four and a half to 5% range. Back in the 80s, that number was 15%. And yet we have had the same degree of inversion here. Uh, that tells us that monetary policy today is much more stringent than it was even in the uh, early 80s, when interest rates were at 15%, um, because 100 basis points on on four and a half to five percent is a lot more dramatic than uh, 100 basis points or one percent on 15% interest rates. So we think monetary policy is much tighter uh, than many many um, understand. The recent cancellation of two major offshore wind projects in New Jersey represents the latest setback for the nascent U.S. offshore wind industry. This development poses a challenge to the Biden administration's ambitious goals of powering 10 million homes through ocean-based turbines by 2030 and establishing a carbon-free electric grid five years later. The Danish wind energy developer, Orsted, cited issues with supply chains, higher interest rates, and difficulties in obtaining desired tax credits as reasons for scrapping its Ocean Wind 1 and 2 projects off southern New Jersey. These projects were initially expected to deliver over 2.2 gigawatts of power. This setback follows the cancellation of power contracts for three projects in New England, which would have provided an additional 3.2 gigawatts of wind power to Massachusetts and Connecticut. These cancellations collectively amount to nearly one-third of President Joe Biden's goal of achieving 30 gigawatts of offshore wind power by 2030. Despite these challenges, offshore wind development is still progressing with recent investments by New York State and the Interior Department's approval of the nation's largest planned offshore wind farm in Virginia. The White House remains optimistic about the expansion of the U.S. offshore wind industry, citing momentum, recent investments, and the creation of union jobs in manufacturing, shipbuilding, and construction. While macroeconomic challenges exist, industry experts believe that, although the U.S. may not reach the 30-gigawatt target by 2030, a significant amount of offshore wind power, around 20 to 22 gigawatts, is still achievable. This would mark a substantial increase from the current capacity, which relies on two small demonstration projects providing only a fraction of a single gigawatt of power. The development of large ocean-based wind farms is critical to government plans to transition to renewable energy, particularly in densely populated East Coast states with limited land for traditional energy infrastructure. Eight East Coast states have committed to offshore wind mandates, aiming to add a combined capacity of over 45 gigawatts. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.